All right, so <laughs> some, uh, some people are fans of sports teams and musicians, and I'm a fan of everybody in this room because this is the group of people that's going to change the paradigm of spine surgery and make endoscopic spine surgery the standard of care in the future. Um, let's see, where's, where's my talk? <clears throat> Um, so, uh, and kind of talking about uh, what Albert w was speaking about, o o awake spine surgery. I do a lot of awake spine surgery. My talk's actually going to, I think, help facilitate this because I'm going to talk about interfascial plane blocks. Uh, and this is a layer that I actually add. I do the same track sort of anesthetizing that you do, but I do this first. So, basically, we're going to black block the entire posterior primary ramus. So, um, my talks on interfascial plane blocks. Um, my bias is I think the endoscope is an elegant weapon for a more civilized age, as you know. Um, that being said, the irony of this talk is if you do tubular or open surgery, you're going to have more benefit from this than the endoscopic guys because it hurts more. So you get a bigger benefit. So the one pearl, if you're the open guy that sat through this whole meeting, this is the one talk you want to watch because I can actually help you a little bit. Um, so, you know, thoracolumbar interfascial plane block is basically anesthetizing the posterior primary ramus and, and getting the paraspinous muscles and skin overlying and, and, and the facet joint. Um, this is a meta-analysis from March of this year in world neurosurgery that basically looked at this uh, interfascial plane block versus no block, and they had benefits. Uh, l less pain with mobilization, less narcotic use post-op day one, um, fewer requests for supplementary rescue anesthesia. So it works. That's, that's the first important step. This is not hocus pocus. Um, this is a facilitator for outpatient spine surgery. So, you know, uh, in, in our hospital system, we are suffocating under the weight of patients that don't need to be in the hospital the stuff that could be done as an outpatient. So from a, from a cost efficiency point of view, from a patient comfort point of view, uh, we need to move some of these procedures to the outpatient center. So what are, what are some of the kind of things that you need to know about to do that? Well, you want to be able to do your surgery probably under three hours. I think that's a reasonable time with troubleshooting. So that doesn't mean it's a three-hour case and then you run into problems and it turns into a four-hour case. That means it's probably a two-hour case that if there's a problem, you've got an hour of futzing around with. You want minimally EBL because you don't want to have to give anybody blood transfusions. That's not something you can do on an outpatient basis. And you have to be consistent and reproducible. You want quality anesthesia. You can't over-narcotize the patient. And, uh, the, and, and by the way, if you look at the same anesthesiologist, the same hospital system doing anesthesia in the hospital and anesthesia in the outpatient center, they do it better in the outpatient center. Why is that? They can't be nauseous. They can't have urinary retention. They can't be gorked out of their mind and not be able to get up and walk. So those patients wake up faster, they have fewer post-op anesthesia complications, and they go home quicker. And you put the same guy in the main, <laughs> main OR, and the same patient is in recovery because they got a ton of fentanyl and they're asleep for three hours. Because it doesn't matter as they're being admitted. Um, if it's done away, you, you want consistent reproducible blocks with good duration control and efficient placement. So that's what we're going to talk about a little bit here. If you're going to use spinal anesthetics for larger or longer cases, you, you want to have your time uh, down so that you're not sitting with a patient who can't move their legs in the recovery room. Uh, I, I will sometimes use one-shot epidurals plus a MAC for shorter and less invasive cases like decompressions because I, I, that's an added um, effect where you don't have to sedate the patient as much. You can get more localized pain control. Um, and then the T-lip or ESP block. So th this is typically done with lysosomal bupivacaine plus bupivacaine, quarter percent, one vial of each. So typically lysosomal bupivacaine comes in a 20 cc vial, uh, quarter percent bupivacaine comes in a 30 cc vial. So if you mix them together, you get 50 cc's, 25 per side for a bilateral approach. Um, I, I don't have lysosomal bupivacaine where I am. I don't have that available to me, so I use 60 cc's of ropivacaine. It's 0.2%. It actually has a little less cardiotoxicity than bupivacaine. I add some dexamethasone, 1 cc and 10 milligrams, and clonidine in 1 cc, which is 100 mics. This is, this is, I didn't make this up. This is the same sort of cocktail that's used for every peripheral nerve, brachial plexus block, uh, in orthopedics, you know, hip, knee, shoulder surgery. This has been used for years, so this is nothing we're not rewriting any books here. Um, 
you can do, you can have, if you have a, a anesthesiologist that is facile with ultrasound, do this in the pre-op area for you so that it has time to, to kick in and, and, and cook so that when you're, if you're Albert and you got your lead on and you're sitting there like, bring me the next patient, um, they're ready to go. You don't have to wait for it. If you're like me, <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta do it under fluoro and drop the needles in uh, under direct fluoro. And this is what it looks like. So basically you're placing the needles. I place the needles, I do an ESP block, uh, which is the rectus spinae complex, is longissimus and uh, iliocostalis, and it sits on the transverse process, and I just lay it on the transverse process. So it's a thoracal lumbar interfascial plane block. That, that's, that technically this is an ESP block, but what I'm gonna show you is that the T-lip and ESP block is the same thing. It, it, it's different places in the same compartment. That's the important thing here. So basically a T-lip block is the inverse of a thoracal abdominal plane block or tap block. So if you, if you know any general surgeons that do hernias and they're doing hernias now without, without general anesthesia under local basically. And it targets the anterior rami for hernia abdominal surgery. This makes these patients very comfortable. They get a little extended effect because the, this tends to be a fairly avascular plane, so the local anesthetic sits around a little longer, and uh, uh, it's, uh, it's fantastic. Um, we're doing the opposite. We're getting the posterior primary AS. So um, this is the, you know, so when you, when you hear, oh, uh, my pain guy did a medial bundle branch block to get the facet joint. Well, a medial bundle branch is a, is a, is a um, branch of the posterior primary ramus that innervates the paraspinous muscles and the skin overlying the, the spine. So um, the first description of this TLIP block was actually in 2015 from uh, Canadian Journal of Anesthesia. This is in French. I do not read French, so it took me a while to find this. <laughs> Uh, and, and this is from this paper. So basically they took uh, medical students in Canada uh, and they blocked them. <laughs> Try getting that through the IRB in, uh, the IRB in the United States. That's, uh, <laughs> and they documented where their uh, anesthetic effect is. So the red part is the more anesthetized area, the purple is a little less, but you can see on the left is sort of the initial block and on the right is a couple hours later and, and it spreads. So the, the medicine spreads in this interfascial plane and goes down, blocks the primary, the posterior primary ramus at multiple levels below where you do the injection. So this is what it looks like under ultrasound. You clearly see the spinous process, multifidus and a little stripe between the um, multifidus and longissimus, that's where you're aiming for. Um, this is the needle coming in. The LA is local <laughs> anesthetic, like two cc's being injected. You wanna see that space open up and create a void. That means that you're in that potential space and you've created the space, you've, you've inflated it. And then you, that's where you inject the medication. And you see it, it tracks down to the transverse process. Now, if you're like me and you looked at those pictures, all you saw was Rorschach tests, because I can't make a damn thing out of these things. <laughs> I'm terrible looking at ultrasound, so. Um, now this makes sense to me. Multifidus longissimus iliocostalis. So you can see the fat stripe between the multifidus and longissimus. That's where you're trying to put the medicine with the T-lip block. But if you notice that fascial sleeve pillowcase over the erector spinae complex goes right down to the transverse process. So I don't need to find a mythical potential space in intramuscular pain, plane under a C-arm. I can just stick my needle on bone and get the same block. So that's the way they, you do it with the ultrasound, with the T-lip, and when you do the erector spinae, you just do it like this, put it on the, on the transverse process. So this is what it looks like in real life. I kind of start on the upper outer part of the transverse process. I aim for the middle of it with a slight caudal and medial trajectory, dock it on bone. This is with a little omnipeg dye mixed with the medication, so you can see it starts tracking along that inner transverse plane and goes down, it'll cover a couple levels down. So when you do this injection, you can do it uh, one to two levels above where you're working. If you're doing this endoscopically, you typically wanna do it at the level you're working at because uh, you don't have as much time for it to spread. Um, this is a study that, another meta-analysis that looked at uh, 2,365 patients, 34 randomized controlled trials, and uh, it compared um, TLIP and ESP blocks and basically found there was no difference. Uh, once, once they controlled for the ESP block being done at the same level. So 
you know, whether you, whether you put the medicine in the thoracolumbar interfascial plane or the rectus spinae plane, it's the same plane. It's just a different portion of it named differently. So again, cocktails, which is what you want, like how does this affect me and what can I take home? Option one, lysosomal bupivacaine, one vial, uh, quarter percent observed free marcaine, one vial, dump it together, fill it up, 18 gauge needle. You have to use at least an 18 gauge needle with lysosomal bupivacaine, by the way, otherwise you'll strip the lysosomes off and you'll get an overdose of marcaine. Hmm. And you typically want to inject one to two levels above the surgical site before the incision. If you're doing, say, a tubular, like if you're doing a fusion, um, and again, you're going to get more benefit from this block if you're doing an open fusion or, or even a minimally invasive fusion than if you're doing a transferamyl discectomy. Um, so you use it on all your lumbar spine cases. Um, if lysosomal bupivacaine is not available, um, I use the ropivacaine, a little less cardiotoxic than bupivacaine, and I add a little dex and a little clonidine. I will typically save like two cc's to kind of throw on the dura at the end as well. So it's like a general feel good tonic. <laughs> um, so all, in, all one and two level endoscopic cases can be performed safely and comfortably on an outpatient basis, and these blocks help facilitate doing these cases on an outpatient basis. So uh, I'll do the block, and then I'll do the same anesthetic track protocol that, that Albert does, because I learned it from him, <laughs> so basically copied what he did. And uh, this makes, when you're introducing in a transferamyl case going across the frame, and that's the painful part, whether it's reaming or you're putting a one-step dilator in, that, that going, basically breaking through the inner transverse membrane and getting into the frame, and that's what initially hurts. And when you do this, that is Im immensely more comfortable. Like the patient is not squirming. You don't have to snow them with propofol to put it in. You get the feedback from the patient, an awake patient, whether or not you're hitting that exiting route in DRG as you're introducing large metal objects into a tight frame. So I find this very helpful. Thank you. Great, uh, really uh, Chris, amazing talk. Great question. Uh, is, you know, in terms of levels, how many levels, for a transfer animal, do you go at the TP of the index level or the level above? And for, because of the fusions, you go one or two levels above, right? Right, so the fusions, you go one to two levels above because the, the, the medicine has more time to, to dissipate. But also, if you put it at the level, and like, let's say you do a T lift and you put it at the level, you're, it's just going to leak into your epidural space, which you also don't want. You don't want them waking up going, I can't feel my leg, it doesn't move, what's going on? And you're, if you're using, especially if you're using lysosomal bupivacaine, which can last for 72 hours, that's not a good thing. So um, you want to put it a little higher, and you can, you can do, you know, multi level lumbar reconstructions will benefit from this, and that medicine will dissipate. Um, for endoscopic, I do it at the level because it's, it's a shorter distance. I want to get that primary ramus that's right there, close your primary ramus at that level. So at the rostral or the coronal? So at 4 or 5, you put it on the... Uh, L4. So 4 or 5. For L4 transfer ammo, I put it on the L4 transverse process. L2, 3, I put it on the L2 transverse process. Okay. So just, just one level, rost like slightly rostral to the foramen, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. like yeah. whatever foramen it is, the... The transverse the process right, above it. Pedicle TP junction, yeah. yeah. How much time do you give it to work before you start uh, operating? Yeah. First thing I do, and then I introduce my, my needle into the foramen, I anesthetize my, my tract, I do my dilation, beaming. So, however long that takes, it takes, I don't know. Five okay. minutes. Five minutes, yeah. So I think, I think Dr. Dr. Gibson made a great point. I mean, if you give it enough time, it'll work very well, definitely. Uh, a, a key a key point. Don't just start working right away. Yeah. And it, it's it's a it's a time concentration matrix, right? So if you have a larger volume into a smaller area, it actually works a little faster, and you get a denser block. Mm -hmm. So that's why you want to put all this medication for. So for unilateral, instead of using 60 cc's, I'll use 30 because I'm only doing the one side. So I'll do the 30 cc's of ropivacaine plus the one of dex and the one of clonidine. But I'll put it at the level because I want to. I want it to push that medicine into that area and, and basically, in essence, it concentrates it Fill and, space. and it works a little faster and it gets a little bit denser of a block. You showed the images with contrast. Do you do that routinely or just just for education here? That was yeah. just for you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. This is, may, may seem like an obvious question or an answer, but. Uh, 
If you do a transfer amino, I'm assuming you're doing an ipsilateral block, and if you're doing a fusion, maybe bilateral. Correct. Is that true? And then, so then, uh, interlaminar. Are you doing just the side of your approach, or how so, do you? So, like for an inter L5 S1 interlaminar discectomy, I'll just do the side I'm doing the discectomy on, because I'm not touching the contralateral side. Right. I'm not. I'm not over there. So. You know, if it's a unilateral procedure, I do the unilateral block. If it's a bi like a ULBD, I'll do a bilateral block. A fusion, I do a bilateral block. And like where you're going to see the biggest benefit is if you do minimally invasive fusions and you do this, you're going to have patients that don't take narcotics post-op on occasion. I saw in your mixture you, you, you put clonidine in there. Is that, what's the reason for the clonidine? Uh, it, it extends the, the time, so it's a, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not, my, my uh, pharmacology is not completely fresh, but it's an alpha antagonist, so it causes vasoconstriction, so it basically makes the, the ropivacaine last longer. Mm. Okay. Well, right. thank you so much. Thank you.